Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for our second tutorial. This tutorial is on immunology and the immune responses. Um, just a few rules, if you're watching on the Zoom, any questions that are relevant to what's being covered during the moment, just pop them into the chat. Any questions that are, can wait to the end, just pop them into the Q&A. If you're watching on the Facebook live stream, just comment your questions and we will make sure that they're passed on. That's all from me and I'll hand over to Chris now. Thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, uh, my name's Chris. I have just finished my third year of medicine at uh, Imperial College in London. Uh, and today we're just going to be covering immunology, in particularly looking at the cell types that are involved uh, and also antibodies. So just to start, a quick disclaimer uh, is that every different medical school will have slightly different ways of teaching. So if you're in doubt between what I say and what you might have learned, go with what you learned for your medical school. But to the best of my knowledge, everything here is, is correct. Um, so here are the learning objectives for today. Uh, we're going to be looking at the innate response initially, which is the first response to uh, the first immune response, and then how that leads into the adaptive response. And then looking a little bit about immune, immune tolerance as well and how, uh, how you regulate the immune response. So just a bit about how this works is at any point, feel free to ask a question. I'm, I'll do my best to answer it. Um, if I can't, I'll make sure I, I, I find a way to look it up and just make sure you get the right answer. Um, as has been said already, if, if you want the question to be answered now, just put it into the, into the chat function. Whereas if it, it's a question that can wait to the end, then you can use the, the Q&A function. Some, some words you'll see are in red. And if that's the case, I want, you to get, I want to make it as interactive as possible. So I want you to give me the definition. And so private message to me. So if you choose a chat function, you choose to all panelists, that'll come to me. And then if, questions in, if, a, if there's a question written in green, again, I want you to private message it to me so I can see what all of your answers are. So let's, let's begin. So before we start with the learning objectives, I think this is a really important, um, really important to understand the lineage of hematopoiesis, which is how, where the cells come from and their cell, their cell lines. So blood stem cell, which is the initial type of stem cell from your bone marrow, can either form the myeloid line or the lymphoid line. Now the myeloid line firstly can turn into red blood cells, but then it also via myeloblasts can become any of these granulocytes and these are types of white blood cell. Um, yeah, I'll just quickly reply to the other uh, question. Uh, I'll make, sure you, I'll make sure you're aware of it when it comes up as well. So red words, I want um, the definition. And green question is for you to answer. There you are. Um, and so that's the myeloid lineage on the left hand side. And then that also forms platelets, which are involved with the uh, blood clotting. And then on the lymph lymphoid side, on the right hand side, that goes to a lymphoblast. And lymphoblasts can turn into three types of cell, either B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, or natural killer cells. We're going to go into quite a lot of detail about what B lymphocytes and what T lymphocytes do. Uh, and we're going to mention natural killer cells a little bit. They're mostly involved with viruses. So at every point, I think it's important to keep in mind this lineage because there can be lots of questions that you can get on it. Uh, it's quite easy to, to, to test you on this. So the first learning objective is understand the uh, role of the innate immune response and the cell types involved. So just as a quick difference between innate and adaptive immunity, often people don't think of the physical barriers in terms of innate immunity, but the fact you have skin to stop um, pathogens getting in the first place, along with mucous membranes and epithelial cells, such as the ones lining your um, trachea and your, uh, your, oso your esophagus, to stop any pathogens getting in that way. That's, all, that's actually the first layer of immunity that we have. And then it's split up into humoral response and cellular response. Cellular, as it's called, is just the different cell types that are involved. Whereas humoral is basically everything else that isn't a cell. So for example, with the innate immune response, that's complement and then some other antimicrobial peptides that you might find. This is really not too important. The, the key is the cellular response. So initially it's neutrophils and macrophages um, and so because this is an innate immunity, it means that these are not specific to the pathogen that you face. They'll just be there to, um, 
they'll, they'll be there to take up any pathogen and to help trigger the adaptive immune response. There's also dendritic cells. These are really interesting cells, which uh, are really big and they sense for pathogens and they take the uh, antigen of the pathogen and they then get it to interact with other cell types. So they might be sitting in your skin, for example, and if they sense a pathogen, they'll take it and then they'll move into your bloodstream to pass the um, antigen into your bloodstream to come into contact with other cell types. Then with adaptive immunity, uh, the humoral side is more important because of antibodies, and we'll talk in a bit of detail about antibodies later. And then also this complement. Uh, you can see the complement is on, is on both sides. Complement is quite a, a complicated um, topic, so I'm not going to go into it in too much detail. I think it's just important to be aware that there's another stream of things other than the cell types which are involved. Complement is just lots of molecules which um, help to aid the immune response. And then the cells of the, of the adaptive immune response are T cells. There's two types, cytotoxic and helper. And we'll, we'll, look at, um, we'll look later on about what those do, as well as T regulatory cells. And then B cells, as well as the plasma cells. And plasma cells are the ones which form the antibodies. So the key thing to take away from this slide is that the innate response is not specific to an antigen or a specific pathogen, whereas the adaptive response is. So uh, this is a green question. So if you can put into the, the chat function, just to me, um, which cells are the first ones? So, so choose all panelists in the chat and which cells are the first cells to respond to an infection? We mentioned some of them on the last slide as well. Brilliant, I'm getting some, some really good answers here. So a lot of people saying macrophages and neutrophils and also dendritic cells, brilliant, which I mentioned before. So that's correct. Somebody wrote T helper cells. Remember that T cells are adaptive immune, uh, yeah, the adaptive immune response. So they'll, they'll come later on. Um, so it's neutrophils and macrophages. And as I mentioned, dendritic cells are able to present the antigen to the neutrophils and macrophages to help them to come into contact with it. So this is just the general sequence of events. You'll have some kind of microbial ligand. And so that is just anything that a microbe has, which your body doesn't have. So that means that when it's sensed by something such as a dendritic cell, it will know that it shouldn't be there and it shouldn't belong to you because it doesn't belong to your own body type. And it de detects that and takes it to these to naive host cells. Naive means that they are not specialized and specific yet. Uh, and host just means that it's your own body has made them. And once these host cells come into contact with the, the ligand, which is often the, the antigen, then they will change and uh, they'll change which genes they produce and express. And they'll produce lots of cytokines and chemokines, which are just signaling molecules for your body. And then the series of events that that signal causes will lead to these host cells to become activated. And then that will trigger the immune response. Uh, someone just asked a question, are naive host cells, immune cells or any cells? So this is just for uh, yeah, cells of the immune system. So it won't take it to an epithelial cell or a hepatocyte. This is, this will be, this is just for uh, immune cells, in particular neutrophils and macrophages. So how are the phagocytes activated? They, they undergo phagocytosis. A phage just means to eat. So phagocytosis is just the process of eating the antigen and then it engulfs the antigen and it mounts it onto its own cell surface using MHC2. Uh, we'll talk in just a couple of slides about the MH, what MHC is exactly. Um, and so once it has this mounted onto the MHC2, it will be able to signal to other cell types that there's this foreign antigen here and that you need to start this immune response. And then once they have become activated, they're just better at doing all of the things that are needed for immune response. So it improves their ability to, to phagocytose and migration, which is able to cross, um, cross across from your blood into your tissue. Uh, it will increase the production of cytokines and chemokines, which we see here. And that is to encourage more and more of this immune response. It's a positive feedback loop because you want to make lots and lots of an immune response to a foreign pathogen. And you can read the other things here about uh, what activated phagocytes can do compared to the naive phagocytes. Um, 
it can be a little bit confusing. Phagocytes can, is, can be synonymous with macrophages is the simplest way to think of it. Um, you can see that they both have the phage within them. Macrophages are just a specific type of phagocyte. So that's the general response for a bacteria. It's a little bit different with viruses. And remember, we're still looking here at the innate immune response. So the main thing that is important for viruses is called interferon, which you, you may have heard of. Um, interferon is just a specialized cytokine with direct antiviral activities. It's in red, but I did, I did give you the definition on the last slide, so I won't ask you to message me this. A cytokine is just a signaling molecule uh, within, your, within your body that some cells can secrete. Um, and then it's the signaling molecule will bind to other cells to cause them to uh, change their transcription of genes and then to become activated. And then this particular cytokine, interferon, also has direct antiviral activity. So it can not just help to trigger other cells, but it can help to dampen down the virus itself. And then it also will help to enhance, like I mentioned, cell types. It will enhance the T cell um, and tissue repair. And it also causes the activation. Remember that I said that once the cytokine binds, it will lead to activation, uh, transcription of certain genes. And then it'll, that, the interferon will cause your immune cells to upregulate the transcription of the genes to, for example, genes which stop virus from entering the, the cell or leaving the cell. Because for a, it, seems, it may seem counterintuitive to stop the virus from leaving the cell, but if it can't complete, uh, if it can't leave, it then can't infect any other cells. So it's fine if it stays within one cell and then that cell is eventually killed because then it can't uh, exacerbate the, the virus replication and infecting other cells. And then it can, uh, so this, this cytokine interferon will also cause lots of other microbial genes to be activated, such as the ones that you can see here. Then once a cell has been infected with a virus and it has been triggered by interferon, it, it will be highlighted so that it's able to be known to the immune system that this cell contains the virus. And that's where the MHC class two comes in because the MHC two, which has mounted the antigen, will act as a signal to say that this cell has been infected with a virus and it needs to be killed to stop that cell from uh, help spread the virus around your body more. And this is done by cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which is the killer T cells, and also by natural killer cells which you mentioned. I remember that these are both within the lymphoid lineage of the hematopoiesis chain that we looked at at the very beginning. Another interesting uh, thing to point out, you can see here, is um, that your cell will have MHC2 to hold the, an antigen that, that a foreign body has, has to prove that there's a, something that shouldn't be within your body but then it also has this MHC1 on it. And MHC1 uh, hosts antigens that are from your body. So that means that other cell types can know that that cell belongs to you. So either the existence of an activating ligand, so for example, an antigen from a virus, or the absence of your MHC1 molecule can trigger natural killer cells to, to, kill, to kill your normal cells that's infected. So for example, you can see here tumor cells or even virus, virus infected cells, they may lose the MHC1 molecule. So if you don't have any MHC1, then you'll want to kill those cells. Um, I've got a question here, which is about MHC and just on the next slide, we'll talk about it. So if I haven't answered it with the next slide, please, please let, let me know and I'll answer it in more, in more detail, if that's okay. Um, it's just on the slide after this one. So we have now, looked at the basis of the innate response, which is macrophages and neutrophils for bacteria and uh, interferon for viruses. And we need to lead that innate response into an adaptive response so we can target this specific um, virus or bacteria that's within your body. And so this is a green question. So if you could answer to all panelists, which cells is it that triggers that gets the information from the innate response to the adaptive response. Does anybody know if you can message me? Okay, great. So I'm getting a lot of people saying T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. 
And these are the uh, adaptive immune response. So I'm looking more for the cells that, that trigger this adaptive response. Um, and that is APCs, which is antigen presenting cells. So for example, once, ac once macrophages have been activated or dendritic cells, these are both the cell types, which like I said earlier, grab onto the antigen and present it onto their cell surface. And then once it's been presented on their cell surface with an MHC2, it means that it can trigger other cell types to know that um, to, to start an immune response against that specific antigen. We'll see later on that B cells also uh, end up presenting antigens, but these are part of the adaptive immune response. So, you, so people that said B cells, you're right as well. Um, but just in terms of getting from the innate to the adaptive response, the particular antigen presenting cells are activated macrophages and dendritic cells. Someone's just asked what the difference is between macrophage and phagocyte. So they're pretty much synonymous. A macrophage is just a specific cell type that is an example of a phagocyte. So a phagocyte is any cell which phagocytoses, so eats and takes up the antigen. And a macrophage, a macrophage is the most common type of phagocyte. Um, so we've mentioned that it mounts the foreign antigen onto the MHC complex. And if we look, if we remember the slide a, a, few, a few slides ago, that said the general process and the general order of things, that then triggers cytokines to activate T cells. Interleukin-12 as an example, there's lots and lots of different cytokines, which are the signaling molecules. Uh, I wouldn't bother learning different ones, um, but interleukin-12 is the one that does this specific thing for anybody that's uh, interested in another layer of detail. And then in response to these T cells being activated by cytokines, they also produce cytokines themselves, which upregulate the activation of phagocytes. So it's reciprocal, and that causes a positive feedback loop where more activated phagocytes leads to more T cells being activated. And then the more T cells, they release interferon gamma, which is another cytokine. And then that upregulates the MHC2 expression on the antigen presenting cells, which allows them to present the antigen more which allows more T cells to um, come into contact with the antigen and more cytokines to be produced. And that's how the, the positive cycle works, positive feedback cycle. And it's really important that at this point, the response becomes specific. So the T cells that you're activating are T cells, which responds to this exact antigen, um, as opposed to the innate, res uh, the innate response, which is just looking for any foreign body, any, any foreign antigen, the adaptive response is then specific to this antigen. Now, I mentioned a few times, I hope this will answer the question that we had, um, that uh, MHC can be a little bit complicated. Uh, it stands for, for major histone compatibility complex, um, and it's encoded by HLA genes. Not too important, but just something that you may, you may see come up. And it's important in presenting antigens to T cells, as you mentioned on the last slide. Now, MHC is polygenic, so if you could, it's in red, so if you could just message me, does anybody know what the definition of polygenic is? You may, if you have a little think about it, you may be able to work it out based on, based on what the word is and what it's made up of. Perfect. I'll give you a few more seconds. Everyone's, everyone's getting it right, so it looks like you know what this is. Polygenic just means that uh, many different genes make up the MHC. So it has lots of loci, lo uh, which are positions on chromosomes that, that then code for proteins. And so polygenic means polymany genic genes, many genes code for the MHC complex, perfect. And then on top of that expression is codominant. So if I could get you to just type to me the definition of codominant. Not exactly to do with immune response, but it's good to just to remember all of the other parts of your, your medicine curriculum are important in all parts of, uh, help you with other parts of the curriculum as well. Let's see what people are putting for co-dominant. People are a little bit less sure on this. Um, so this is to do, this is to do with the dominance of the alleles, which you're, which you're getting right. But what this means is that both your allele from your mother's side and your father's side uh, um, are expressed. Whereas you might know of, of diseases which are, which are dominant on recessive genes, whereas in this case neither gene from your mother or your father is the dominant one or the recessive one, they're both expressed and they're both co-dominant. 
And that's important because you need to know which cell types are your own body types, are, are your own body cells. Um, so you need your cells to express all of the, the MHC from both sides of the lineage to make sure that your immune response doesn't start attacking your own, your own cells. So there's two types, as I mentioned, there's MHC1, and MHC1 presents endogenous antigens. This, this is a, I know you've had lots of definitions, but if you can just tell me, tell me in the chat again, uh, if you know what the word endogenous means. And remember, if, even if you don't know the answer, it really doesn't matter, your messages are just going to me, feel free to, to give it a guess if you don't know what it is. Yeah, perfect. So some people are getting it and uh, endog endogenous just means that it's your own body's antigens as opposed to exogenous, which means that it's a foreign antigen. So this is uh, on, this, on the slide about natural killer cells, which we had a couple ago, where we said that your MHC1 presents your own body cells, your own body antigens, so that immune cells don't start attacking them and they know that it's your own body cells. Whereas on the other hand, MHC2 are, it is only found on prof professional antigen presenting cells, and that is what pre presents foreign antigens. So every single cell type from a hepatocyte epithelial cells will, uh, will have MHC1 to present your own antigens, whereas only some cells, so professional antigen presenting cells, will have MHC2 on it. And the MHC2, both of these things are just basically a mount, so, so you can mount the antigens onto your cell surface. So let's just quickly go through some questions to check that you've understood this. Uh, there's the poll option. So I'm just going to open up the first question. And that should be, that should be open now. So if you want to vote for that. I'll give you, I'll give you 20 more seconds. Okay, it looks like most of you have voted and you are 100% right, well done. Neutrophils are the, are the, along with macrophages, are the very first cell type to respond. Therefore, that must mean they're part of the immune, the innate immune response. Second question now, uh, let me just open it up. Launch palm. I'll give you 20 more seconds. Okay, looks like most of you have voted, so I'll share those results. Most of you getting it right, a couple, a couple of wrong answers in there. Um, but the answer was natural killer cells. These are involved in killing, uh, particularly virus uh, virus infested cells, so cells which have the virus in them, natural killer cells will then kill those. Whereas we spoke about both dendritic cells and activated macrophages uh, are antigen presenting cells, so they will have uh, the MHC2 complex to mount exogenous antigens. And B lymphocytes, I did mention on one of the slides, that they are also antigen presenting cells, and we're going to come on to how that happens in a, in a little bit. Brilliant. Remember, if you have any questions at any point, feel free to, to put it into the chat to me. So that's the innate response. And we've looked a little bit about antigen presenting cells. Leading us in so now we're going to look at what happens with the adaptive response and in particular B cells and T cells, as well as antibodies. And this forms the majority of how the adaptive response works. So there, we, we mentioned before that there are two main types of T cells, helper T cells and killer T cells. So firstly, let's look at the functions of helper T cells. One is B cell activation. So just to, it's, it's important to keep the chronology, the order that things are happening in mind. So you've had your antigen presenting cells releasing cytokines to activate T cells. Once the T cells are activated, what they can do is in turn activate B cells. And B cells are what produce um, antibodies and, the, and they cause B cells to undergo affinity maturation. Uh, affinity maturation just means uh, being activated, basically, and going from um, 
a naive cell to an activated cell. They also uh, activate phagocytes, and we mentioned this before actually, about the reciprocal activation. So phagocytes will release cytokines to activate T cells, and then T cells in turn will release cytokines to activate phagocytes. Then that will help the phagocytes to phagocytose, so, um, uh, which are able to help, help to kill pathogens. Somebody has just asked me a question, which is, uh, is affinity maturation the same as clonal expansion? Um, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure, to be honest. I think that there is a slight difference in that clonal expansion, uh, is once it has undergone maturation, then lots and lots of copies of it are made and it undergoes massive positive feedback loop, uh, expansion. Whereas affinity maturation is just the process of them becoming activated in the first place. I hope that answers your question. Um, next we have regulation. So T reg cells, uh, we'll come onto it later in terms of the regulation, but because it's a positive feedback loop, this whole process, you don't want it to just go on forever because if you have a positive feedback, lap, lap, a positive feedback loop that goes on forever, it'll just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So eventually you need to stop that response because eventually you're going to have got rid of the, the bacteria, the virus, you'll have made immunity. Um, so that's a specific type of T helper cell, which are called T, T reg, regulatory cells, T reg cells. And they help to dampen down the T cell response when, it, when at the end of the, um, at the end of the process. Uh, and then finally is uh, hypersensitivity. So this is an, a, an immune response and this isn't a good thing. You may have T cells that actually cause an immune response against things that shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be bad. So for example, that allergy. And then we also have killer T cells and these are just involved in the direct killing of infected cells. So you mentioned this, that once a cell has, uh, is showing that it's got the, the foreign antigen within them, or it does not showing its own antigens. So either more of MHC2 showing that it's got, um, is labeled to tell that it's got a bacteria or a virus there, or uh, less of the MHC1, then the killer T cells will, will come and kill those cells. And it's really, really important to remember that once a T cell response has been triggered, this is a specific response to that exact antigen that has been activated. So we've, we've gone as far as helper T cells are activating B cells, and then B cells are able to produce antibodies. Antibodies have four main functions, which is opsonization, and this just enhances the phagocytosis by, done by phagocytes, macrophages, by marking an antigen in a cell. So once an antibody binds to a cell that, is, that needs to be destroyed, it will make it more easy for it to be seen by phagocytes and therefore just destroyed. Uh, sorry, someone just asked me a question to go back to the last slide, uh, which is what do you mean by the replicative niche in the previous slide? Uh, so a niche is just what is the, the situation that is needed for, for a virus or a bacteria to be able to, um, to be able to proliferate and upregulate its production. For example, a virus does upregulate the production of more viral protein. So for a virus, that has to be intracellular. The virus has to be within your cell and use your own um, organelles to make more of its protein. So if you just kill the cells that have the virus in them, the virus is unable to keep replicating because you've destroyed its niche. Uh, I hope that, that makes sense. Sorry for not mentioning that. So that's opsonization, which is uh, enhancing phagocytosis. And there's also neutralization, which is uh, directly stopping the bad, the bad proteins or the, the bad molecules that the bacteria or the virus is creating. So they might be producing harmful um, proteins and antibodies can directly bind those harmful proteins and get rid of them. Agglutination uh, clumps together lots of infected cells. And by clumping them together, it makes it easier for phagocytes to then come along and destroy all of them at once. And then finally, complement activation. And again, complement is this complicated system of lots and lots of proteins that get made. And they help with inf making inflammation, which helps to get more cell types to the more white cells to the site of infection. And it has lots of other functions too, and antibodies are involved in, in that. So just to recap what we've gone through so far, is you've had your dendritic cell finding, finding your antigen, and it becomes an antigen presenting cell and presents it to the T helper cell. 
the T helper cell then uh, interacts with a B cell to help upregulate B cell production and undergo monoclonal um, replication, which we mentioned before. And then your B cells can then go on to make lots and lots of antibodies. And it's important to remember, as I've said many, many times, that at this point, it becomes specific to the exact antigen, which means that any of the antibodies you're producing from these B cells will be only against the antigen that has been picked up from the dendritic cell initially. So next on to, we've spoken a lot about T cells, next on to how B cells actually work. B cells have a receptor on their cell, on their cell surface, which is basically a, an antibody which is mounted onto the cell surface, and it looks like this. It's formed up of uh, the heavy chains and the light chains. Um, and it also has these things, this is not too important, so if you haven't seen it before, don't worry about it, but I just thought I'd add in a little bit of extra detail. It has Ig alpha and Ig beta, and these just help with signaling it into the cell. They actually have longer tails than the tails on the B cell receptor. So once something is bound to the B cell receptor, these just help to um, convey that information deep into the cell so it can then act on it. And this B cell receptor is exactly what gives a B cell specificity to a particular antigen. Um, because, uh, I'll just get this up, it has the variable region here and it has the constant region here. So the constant region is the same on every single B cell receptor on every single B cell. Whereas the variable region is different and will be a different shape so that it can bind to a different antigen. And that is what allows you to be able to form an immune response to lots and lots of different types of antigen. And the way that this happens is with the gene recombination. Um, gene recombination, we'll go into a bit onto the next slide because it can be quite complicated. Um, but it just allows for lots and lots of different shapes of the variable region so that you can then respond to lots of different antigens. And it's important to remember that the heavy chain and the light chain, as you can see with the dark and the light color here, is different to the variable region and the constant region. So once an antigen is activated to B cell, it undergoes affinity maturation. And I mentioned it before, so I will ask you to, to message me in the chat what affinity maturation actually means. Someone did ask me a question about this uh, a few minutes ago, so I, I purposefully didn't answer so that we can get the answer now as you messaged me. Yeah, great. So it's the, it's the maturation, as, a lot, as some of you have said. Um, and by, by maturing, it, it actually increases the affinity with which um, the B cell receptor combines to an antigen. So by undergoing affinity maturation, it, affinity just means how strongly it binds. So once it's undergone affinity maturation, if it comes into contact with that antigen, it's a lot more likely to bind to it and then cause more and more of this immune response. And then it can also undergo clonal expansion. So lots and lots of copies of it are, are made. Somebody uh, has asked, uh, what is the difference between the FC region, which is the constant region of the different uh, immunoglobulins like IgG and IgM? Uh, so we'll, we'll, look at, we'll look at that in just a couple of slides time, actually. So again, if I haven't answered it in that slide, then do ask me again, but I think we should cover that. And then once it's undergone affinity maturation, uh, that's when memory B cells are made. And then this is what gives you an immunological memory so that you will then have uh, a response if you were to come into that antigen again. Because it's undergone this affinity maturation, it binds more strongly to the antigen, so you can undergo the whole immune response just much more quickly. Just as a quick note, the, the B cell receptors I said are basically an antibody and they're, they're mostly IgM, but they may be IgD as well. But if you get a question about it, it's likely to be an IgM antibody. And we'll go on to what that means in a few slides time. So I, I, someone's asked, is the variability in the variable region due to the light chain? And if you look at the diagram, you can see that it's actually both chains that make up the variable region. So um, the variability is because of both some, it's because of some of the light chain and some of the heavy chain. And we'll look at how that happens now. And this can get really complicated. So if it isn't fully making sense to you, I wouldn't stress about uh, trying to understand it because it's one of those things that is, has a lot of different layers to it. So the more you try and understand it, it may even become more difficult to, to know what's going on. Um, 
So the variable region of the B cell receptor has a few different chains. The kappa and lambda chain are both on the light chain, whereas the heavy chain, as we saw, is, is slightly different. And these are found on lots of different chromosomes. It's a multi-gene family, which is what we mentioned before about being polygenic. So there's different loci on different chromosomes, which holds the proteins to make this structure. And you take different bits of each of these loci, of each of these genes from different chromosomes, and you just get a random combination from, uh, from each of these genes. And that's what allows you to get 10 to the 10, which is a massive number, uh, different types of variable region. You have much fewer than that many genes in your, in your like in each nucleus, in each cell. So it wouldn't be possible to have a, a single gene for each type of combination, which is why it has to undergo um, this, this method from lots of different, this method from different genes in the polygenic genes. Um, and yeah, as I said, remember that there's a heavy chain and a light chain, which is different to the variable region and the constant region. And as the question that was just asked, the variable region and the constant region both help to make up the, um, sorry, the, the heavy chain and the light chain both help to make up the, the variable region. So that's, that's the B cell receptor. And now just look at how antibodies are actually produced. Um, it needs, a, a naive B cell to be activated needs two signals. Firstly, directly coming into contact with the microbe itself. So microbial con constituents, you may have heard of damps and pamps. Uh, which is damage associated my, um, damage associated microbial peptides, I think. Um, whereas PAMPs are pathogen associated. So damage associated is things which shouldn't be floating around in your blood. For example, ATP should only be found within cells. So if it's if it's within the blood, it means that a cell must have been damaged and destroyed for it to have been to for it to leak out. Uh, yes, yeah, damage associated molecular patterns, thank you. Um, whereas pathogen associated molecular patterns uh, is things that are found only on microbes, for example, the antigens, antigens on a virus or a bacterium, or any of the things that it releases, like the peptides it might release to, to actually cause damage. And then it also, as we've spoken about, needs the signal from the T helper cell to be able to be activated. So, if it only comes into contact with one of these, such as the microbial constituents, you only end up making IgM. And IgM, as we'll see on the next slide, is the acute response. So that means that you don't end up getting an immunological memory for it. Um, sorry, the a microbial constituent is often a, a polysaccharide. So for example, uh, on the surface of, of bacteria, they often have polysaccharides, and that might be what you come into contact with. Um, and, it, and it means there's no memory, memory cells are made. But if you get both of these activations, so the constituents and the T helper cell, it means that all classes of immunoglobulin, which is another word for antibody, can be made. And then that will allow you to produce a, a memory. So just to run through everything we've said so far, we've had the antigen presenting cell, presenting the antigen to the T cell, which then mounts the antigen onto the MHC class two, and presents it to the, to the B cell. And then this allows the B cell to undergo affinity maturation and then monoclonal expansion to make lots and lots of copies. Okay, and now just look at the different types of antibody. I always remembered it as gamed because these are the five different types, IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE, and IgD. And it's also um, the order of how, how common they are. So IgG is the most common, and then A and then M. D is not very important. Um, and you don't really see very much. This is what they look like. They, you can see that the general structure is all the same, uh, but that IgM comes with five of them put together. Uh, it's really not too important to, to know about, but uh, just in case you're, you're interested what the difference is by looking at them. And now to know what each of the classes do. So IgG is the secondary response. So that means that it's not initial when you first come into contact with the um, pathogen. You don't make IgG immediately. That's more of a long-term response. So one way that I got taught it recently is that IgG stands for gone. So the pathogen has gone, but these will give you memory because they hang around for a long time. Next is IgA, which is secreted as a dimer. So two, two different antibodies held together. And it's secreted into, um, off 
into mucous surfaces, so into your mucus, into your tears, into your saliva, to stop the pathogen entering your body in the first place. IgM is the initial type of antibody that's made at the very beginning of the response. Uh, one way that somebody said, which is, uh, which is uh, an interesting way to remember, is that IgM, you go, man, that's acute, which is a terrible, terrible way of remembering, but it's almost so bad that it helps you remember. So man, that's acute is the acute response, whereas IgG is gone. IgE uh, is involved in allergy, and then also just for anti-parasitic uh, anti activity. So that's to stop parasites. So again, much less important than uh, G, A, and M because you're more likely to come into contact with bacteria and viruses than parasites. And then IgD is not very important. Just be aware that it also exists. So just a few questions on what we've gone through since the last one. Um, and I'll open up this poll now. I'll give you 30 seconds total. Okay, it's looking like most of you have answered. And I'll share the results. So the correct answer was optimization. I put that in as a little bit of a red herring. So optimization is actually one of the functions of antibodies. Um, and this is just I took from that slide a few a few slides ago. These are the four functions of antibodies, whereas the the other three are all uh, functions of T helper cells. And then one more question. Give me one second to open it up. I'll give you thirty seconds for this one as well. Brilliant, so we're on 100% correct at the moment, so I'll end it and share the results. Um, IgG is the right answer. So remember, IgG G is gone. So the secondary immune response, the memory cells that you make will be IgG. Brilliant. That's good, it looks like everyone's understood all of those things. Uh, and here's just a quick run through again of what each of the different types of antibody do. And then the final section I wanted to look at was immune regulation. Um, and there's two, two learning objectives we got here. One is immune tolerance and looking at central and peripheral tolerance. Tolerance is just making sure that you don't produce too strong of an immune response. And then also looking at regulatory T cells and how they help with dampening the immune response. So what, is immune, what does immune regulation actually mean? Uh, immune regulation is just making sure that your immune response isn't too strong so that it only targets foreign antigens and doesn't target either your own cells or foreign bodies which are not um which are not pathogens so for example allergies you shouldn't be producing an immune response to something like peanut butter whereas if it goes wrong you may end up producing immune response and that's where immune regulation has gone wrong so just to look at the there's three different types of where how immune regulation can go wrong firstly autoimmune and autoimmune is where your immune response attacks your own body cells. Um, and that's autoimmune diseases are both because of environmental triggers, but then also because of underlying susceptible genes. And so if you could just message if you, uh, if you can think of any uh, autoimmune diseases that cause an inflammatory response. There are lots and lots of them, so just see if you can get maybe two or three. Uh, just whilst we're writing that, somebody else, somebody has asked uh, about the the constant region of uh, antibodies and the difference between IgG, IgA, IgM, and the uh, etc. Um, so it's not it's really not so important to know the struct the structure in that much detail. Uh, I don't I don't know if the constant region is the same between the different types. I think it's well, I'm, actually I'm sure it's it is different between them, 
but you don't need to know in any more detail than that that how they're different. Um, okay, so just looking at some of the the diseases you've got, they're all really good. A lot of people are saying RA, so that's rheumatoid arthritis, uh, ulcerative, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, Graves, all really good. There are a couple here which are not autoimmune, so just to point out that cystic fibrosis, um, cystic fibrosis is not autoimmune, that's due to a dysfunction in the chloride channel. And then multiple sclerosis, I think is, is, well, is also not, uh, multiple sclerosis does cause damage to your own cells, um, but I think that it's an unknown how, uh, it's an unknown uh, etiology of that disease. But brilliant, you're all getting the, the right answers there, apart from those couple. So yeah, I have them here. Oh, I do have MS. So it is, it, so it is attacking your own, um, it's attacking the myelin sheath of your own neurons and psoriasis as well and eczema. So on the other hand, there's allergy. And that's, like I said, being producing an immune response to something which shouldn't cause an immune response. And this is because of IgE and also by mast cells. And they release their granular sites that they have within them. And that causes inflammation. So if you think of somebody who has a bad allergic response, everything swells up. They, their, their lips might swell up. That's, that's IgE and mast cells uh, releasing histamine, which causes inflammation. And then finally, and this is a bit less important, is hypocytokinemia and sepsis, uh, which looks like it's... Uh, which sounds like it's quite complicated, but it's just where you produce too much of an, immu of an immune response to something that is bad. And sepsis is once um, a bacteria or something enters your bloodstream and you produce, you're produce you producing an immune response that's going throughout your whole body. And that causes a lot of damage because of widespread inflammation can cause a lot of fluid loss. Um, and then you might become very dehydrated and your blood pressure might go down. Somebody's asked, does IgE cause vascular permeability? So it's not that IgE does it itself, but IgE will release histamine and other, um, other things. And that is what causes increased vascular permeability, so then, which will then cause increased uh, loss of fluid from your blood vessels. Okay, so looking more at regulation, um, there are three ways that if, if, you, if you damage some tissue with an, with an immune response, uh, which will happen because you're, the, the point is to damage, is to kill the infected cells. There are three different ways that that could end. Either resolution, which is that it's all gone to plan, and your cell, your cell type afterwards um, is exactly the same as it was beforehand. Or there's repair, which is where you might have scar tissue, which is where instead of laying down the correct cell types, you lay down uh, collagen and fibroblasts, and that's just any type of scar that you might have where it's, it's not a bad thing uh, necessarily in terms of damage to your body, but it's just laid down scar tissue, which will never act the same way as the normal tissue did in the first place. Or in some cases, you might have chronic inflammation. Um, so for example, you might have, if you, a lot of people have a bad back that damaged it initially, and then there's a constant immune response for the rest of their life uh, with active inflammation. And so that's why you need these active control mechanisms to stop it going to chronic inflammation or even trying to stop repair, but instead getting to resolution where your cell type, where your cells get back to how they were before the damage by the pathogen in the first place. And that's what tolerance is to stop an, uh, a response to a persistent allergen. Um, uh, and so there's central and peripheral tolerance. And we'll look at those two different things now. So central tolerance happens before the T cells or the B cells enter the circulation. For B cells, this happens within, within the bone marrow. So remember that both B cells and T cells are made within the bone marrow, but where they undergo, um, where they mature a little bit and, and where they undergo tolerance is different for both of them. So B cells is within the bone marrow and immature B cells um, come into contact with antigens. And if they come into any con contact with an antigen and it, and it cross links with the IgM, so the antibody that's, on, that's stuck on their cell surface, so the B cell receptor, then that means that that B cell will produce an immune, immune response to your own body's cells. And you don't want that because then once that B cell enters your circulation, it will bind to your own body cells and start trying to damage them. And so that, if that happens within the B cell, within the bone marrow, sorry, that will lead to apoptosis of the B cell. For T cells, it is a little bit different. This happens in the thymus gland, which sits around, around here, just in the center of your chest. And there's two different things that can happen that will lead to um, apoptosis of the cells. 
either they don't bind to any MHC, self, so MHC1, and that's, that will lead to apoptosis because if the T cells don't bind to MHC1 at all, it means that even if you find a cell that's infected, it doesn't bind strongly enough with that cell to start causing the immune response and, and the whole path that we've been talking about. So that cell will, because of neglect, i.e. there's no active destruction of these cells, they just stay in the thymus and because they never, they never bind to any self MHC1 cells, um, they will undergo apoptosis so that they, because they're going to be useless if they enter the circulation. On the other hand, if they bind too strongly to your self MHC, so your MHC1, then that is that in some ways is worse than binding too weakly because that will then lead to damage of your own cells. And then this undergoes apoptosis by negative selection, i.e. they're actively destroyed as opposed to by neglect. And your thymus has, you may have heard of this autoimmune regulator. Uh, it's a gene that is only found within the thymus and it expresses every type of antigen that is found in any cell type within your body. And so that means that the T cells can come into contact with all of the antigens within uh, the thymus that you, they then may come into contact with once it's peripheral and so that you can be sure that it won't cause any damage to any of your cells. And this is important because it can go wrong. This is a very rare disease, but if you have something wrong with this gene, so a mutation, it leads to uh, autoimmune polyendocrinopathy syndrome one, complicated name. But if you think about it, that your T cells are unable to come into contact with, with all of the antigens once it's at the thymus, it means that once they enter the peripheral circulation, they will cause massive widespread autoimmune destruction where it binds to your own cells because you won't allow this negative selection of cells of T cells that bind too strongly. That is central tolerance. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna go back to the previous slides. I've got a little question about it, which is to explain the B cell part again. Uh, yep, so your, your B cells, um, centrally, if they're IgM, which is the B cell receptor, if that binds to any antigens within the bone marrow, that means that, that that B cell receptor would cause damage to your own cells. Remember that the B cell receptor is made from a random combination of all of these different genes from lots of different chromosomes and that to produce the variable region. So some of those variable regions will just by chance of the fact that you're creating 10 to the 10 different variations uh, fit antigens that are found within your own body types. Um, so if one of the B cells is made, which does, that does happen to them, then you don't want that to be able to enter your circulation because then once it does, it will lead to damage to your own cells. So if that is the case, i.e. that the B cell receptor binds to any antigen that it encounters within the bone marrow, then that will just lead to the destruction of that B cell. So that it will never ever get the chance to enter your circulation and will never get the chance to damage your own cell types. I hope that's a little bit clearer. Great. Uh, so that's central tolerance. And then just looking at peripheral tolerance, there are four different methods of peripheral tolerance. So peripheral tolerance obviously means once the cells have already entered your circulation, um, how does it stop it from binding too strongly to, to antigens or causing damage where it shouldn't be? So firstly is energy. And this is a lack of co-stimulatory signals. Um, so basically once there's uh, once inflammation is produced, so i.e. the complement system, which helps to produce inflammation, and then the release of histamine and things, that produces lots and lots of lots of molecules, and some of those are co-stimulatory molecules, and you need the, you need those to be there as well, as well as all of the other methods like the T cells. Um, and stimulate the the B cells to to become, to become activated, and so if you don't have that inflammation and you don't have the co-stimulatory signals, it will mean that the, the, the B cells and T cells never actually become activated peripherally. Um, next is ignorance. And this is where the T cells and the B cells never come into contact with that area of your body because uh, you, don't want them to, you don't want the risk of them damaging that site. So for example, within your eye, there is no chance that a pathogen will get to within your eye because it's a sealed off system. So you don't have uh, T cells and B cells entering your eye. Um, and that's what is known as an immunologically privileged site. Uh, so it also in some ways, this is like the blood brain barrier. 
so within your brain um t cells and b cells may not get there as much because there's um very little chance that a pathogen will get there themselves and you don't want your t cells and your b cells attacking your brain because that would obviously be very bad next is deletion um and that is if if, it's, if a cell type does manage to get through the central tolerance and they do have, they do bind too strongly to one of your own MHCs, so one of your own cells, then antigen presenting cells, um, which are presenting lots of self antigens, if a T cell or a B cell binds to that, then that will cause the cell to upregulate a gene called the FAS ligand, which you may have heard about. FAS ligand is just, uh, is basically the death receptor. So it, once you have lots of the fast ligand on your cell surface, that leads to destruction of the cell and cell death. So basically what, what, this whole, what this whole thing means is that if a cell type has managed to get through central tolerance, then it will induce its own cell death by when it, once it binds to your own MHC1s so that it can't cause any other damage uh, to other cell types in your body. And finally is regulation, and that's done by Treg cells, which we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about now. How T reg cells work. So the actual mechanism of action is that they secrete cytokines which are immunosuppressive so it dims down your immune response, it dulls down the immune response and it inactivates dendritic cells and the responding lymphocytes. Remember that the T reg cells are both for at the end of an immune response and then also for peripheral tolerance so that you don't damage your own cells too much. T-reg cells express a gene which is called uh, FOXP3. It's a transcription factor. It's really not too important, but just quickly mention it because a mutation in this gene leads to another complicatedly named disease, which is polyendocrinopathy enteropathic X-linked disease. Um, which basically means, again, if you, have, if you don't have T-reg cells because there's a mutation in the FOXP3 gene, it will mean that you won't have regulation. So you'll have too much autoimmune, uh, resp uh, too much immune response, which will become autoimmune and start damaging your, your own cells. And then that will lead to obviously widespread damage of your own cells. So there are two different types of T regulatory cells. Firstly is natural, which are developed in the thymus um, and stay in the peripheral tissues. And they are from being within the thymus, they're, they're, sorry, they're developed in the thymus and from then onwards, they're ready to to do their job, which is just different to inducible T cells, T reg cells, which are only produced in the periphery. And they, they, once they've been produced within the periphery, they stay within the peripheral tissues. And this will help to dampen down the immune response at the end uh, of the pathogen being there. So one final question, just to check that we've understood all of this, and then we're done. Let me just open up the poll. So which of the following is not involved in peripheral tolerance? Fifteen more seconds. Great, it's looking like most of you have voted, so we'll end it there. And again, the majority of you got this right, so well done. It's the, the air gene. And remember that the air gene is what we find within the thymus, uh, so that it presents every type of antigen that you see within your body to your T cells. So that's involved in the central, uh, central regulation as opposed to peripheral, uh, central tolerance. So that is the last, that's the last question I have for you. Please do scan this QR code and uh, fill out the feedback. I, I'm around now, so if you have any um, if you have any more questions, please please ask them now. So somebody's ask what uni I go to and if we'll need to know this in clinical years. So I'm I've just done third year at uh, Imperial ICSM uh, in London, Imperial College School of Medicine, and you've asked if we need to know this in clinical years. So I think it is really important. It's surprisingly important how much the stuff that you learn in your preclinical years it really helps to give a foundation and a basis for your learning of clinical things. And it will help you to understand diseases a lot. So for example, everything that we've learned today is really important for uh, autoimmune diseases and hypersensitivity reactions, which I, I didn't have time to talk about today. And so if you can understand this, the basic science behind it, 
it will make learning the clinical stuff a lot a lot easier. If there's any more questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, and please do fill out the feedback. It will really help me to give better tutorials uh, from now onwards. Uh, somebody's asked if, I'm, if I'll be doing any more lectures. Yep, I am, I'll be doing a um, hematology tutorial. Uh, in a couple of weeks time just keep an eye out on your emails for for the exact date that that will be but yeah I am that, that I've got that lined up as well and I've also done a couple of um, neuro tutorials already so if you look back to your emails you should be able to find the slides and the links to the videos for that if you want if you want to look at those too okay I think that's good good time to finish then so thank you very much everyone for coming to to watch have a good rest of the day